Up next, we'll be discussing part two of the Catholic Gentleman's Rule of Life. Stay tuned. Thank you for joining us for another episode of The Catholic Gentleman. We are blessed that you have decided to be here with Sam Guzman and John Heinen, your hosts. We are discussing, as Sam said, uh, the second section of the rule uh, to be a Catholic gentleman in Sam's book here. We're going to put that in the show notes. If you didn't listen to the first episode, you know, feel free to just jump on your podcast player or on the YouTube and jump back to that episode and listen to it. Although this episode is going to be uh, unique in itself and so you can just stay tuned. I wanted to let the routine listeners know that we are taking the next two weeks off. So for Christmas and the new year, we are going to be off for two weeks. I'm going to be doing some replays of some of our best performing episodes from this last year. Um, so feel free to jump into those, especially if you're new to joining us. If you are new to joining us, please uh, click subscribe on the podcast player of your choice. Click subscribe on YouTube if you're watching us there. And I'd also ask you guys to write us a review or leave us a comment on YouTube that helps expand the reach. It helps the algorithm and all that uh, to help us reach more men. So right before we come into Christmas time, I'd love to um, ask your help for Cross Catholic Outreach. So this is kind of our final call here. We have partnered with Cross Catholic Outreach to help drill wells in Africa. There's going to be 15 wells that are going to be drilled to help people that don't have clean drinking water and are dying or are suffering from illnesses because of that lack of clean drinking water. So that link is in the show notes. And it's also on our website. Um, you can find it on our um, social media pages as well. We'd appreciate any amount that you can offer them. So again, thanks for being here. Sam, do you want us to start out on rule number seven. Yeah, absolutely. So just a reminder, there's 13 rules in the Catholic gentleman's rule of life. Um, not that 13 is any uh, particularly significant number, but just that um, it helps uh, us. Uh, there's really more about the rules rather than, than the numbers. So on number seven is, I will honor women acknowledging their great dignity as daughters of God. So the, the, the number one thing that men first notice about women is that they're different. <laughs> and that's a, a biological reality. Um, and of course, when I say I speak about women, we're painting with a broad brush here. There's all different kinds of women. So if anything I say here, please don't take as an absolute statement about women. However, women are, we'll start with the biological. They're different biologically. They're different physically. They have longer hair. They have, you know, different bone structure. They have different reproductive organs. They are different than men. They're often smaller physically. They're often um, uh, more beautiful <laughs> than yeah, men, that's right. just truth be told. Um, and so it, the awareness of feminine dignity starts with that sense that, okay, look, I'm encountering somebody who's not just one of the boys. I'm going to treat them differently because they are different than me. Um, second, we'll also notice that they are daughters of God. They come from the same father, so to speak, and they have the same human dignity as we men do. Now, there have been periods of human history where um, people have literally thought that women were like defective men, mm -hmm. um, that there was something that they were basically like an inferior version of a man. And men were inherently superior in the order of nature than women. That's incorrect. You know, they are daughters of God. They have the same value, same dignity, same human worth as men, while also acknowledging that women are different. Yeah. And they have the biological difference, yes, but there's also a fundamental psychological difference. Women see the world differently than men. And anybody who's married can pick up on this rather quickly, that men and women see problems differently. They see relationships differently. They see um, work differently. They raise they like different attitudes towards raising children. Just a silly example of this. 
Um, my my wife and I handle uh, our kids differently when it comes to safety. Mm. Women want to keep kids safe. They want to keep them close. They want to avoid danger at all costs. Men, on the other hand, tend to like to push their kids into uncomfortable territory. Um, so men are about the new, the unknown, the uncomfortable, the unfamiliar. Get out there, launch, grow your skills, uh, push yourself, face your fears. Women are like, I don't want him to get a scraped knee. I don't want him to have a broken bone. Don't climb that tree. You might fall out and end up in the emergency room. Whereas a man is like, climb that tree push yourself. I'm so proud of you for doing something risky and dangerous. Just let him do it. And, and there's been many times when, you know, we're at the park and I'm just letting my kids roam around because I'm all about letting them have new experiences. And my wife is like, keep them close, keep them safe, keep an eagle eye on them at all times. So even just like psychologically, there's this difference of orientation like fundamentally, we're all human. We all have the same deep desires in our in the deepest core of our being. But on the surface level, there's there's significant differences in the way that men and women approach the world and the way that we see the world. And a lot of what marriage is, is like learning to work through that, like learning men, like developing a sense of empathy, like, OK, maybe I don't see the world this way. But like imaginatively, I can project myself into my wife's worldview and I can see where she's coming from. And likewise, it's a struggle for women to understand how men think. Um, yeah. there's, there's a couple of books that helped us earlier in our marriage. Like one was for men only and the other one was for women only. It was written mm -hmm. by a, a, a couple who researched the differences between men and women. And basically, they found a lot of marital conflicts came down to the fact that men and women just see the world in very different ways. So let's understand that and like, let's work through that. Um, so when it comes to acknowledging the dignity of women, I think it comes down to a certain sensitivity and respect for the difference of women and the way they see the world differently. Um, men are can be very insensitive sometimes because we don't we're not as sensitive by nature ourselves yeah um we aren't as feelings oriented we're more action oriented we're not as relationship oriented we we're more about fixing things and doing things um and so we see a problem we want to fix it right away but sometimes our wife just needs us to listen or just needs us to relate or just needs us to connect emotionally um, but even, even outside of the marital context, we need to bring the same kind of sensitivity to the way women see the world that doesn't come naturally to us men. So it's something we have to cultivate. And so start with acknowledging the dignity of women and then cultivate a sensitivity to the way they see the world. They're even biologically, like there's a, you know, men and women love, they love the media loves to ignore the difference. Mm -hmm. Until there's a, like a natural disaster or something. And then you right. see pictures of like a flood zone. And I remember this one picture very vividly. Yeah. Like this, this, this big strapping man was carrying his neighbor, who was a young lady. She was probably like in her 20s. He was carrying her through the floodwaters to safety. And I just remember thinking like, that's what masculine strength is for, is to serve um, our neighbor. And, our, and women are our neighbor and we are yeah. there to serve them um and so anyway just just a lot of thoughts there but but it starts with acknowledging that they are our sisters in christ so to speak amen and so i couldn't agree more i think that's excellent you reminded me of a story just last night just last night my son david who's five years old and again don't fully judge but this is the difference between man and woman he saw me lighting the advent candles uh before the beginning of of dinner and I let the light, set the lighter on the um, counter. And David, my five-year-old, uh, almost six uh, son, grabbed the lighter and was trying to, to start the lighter. And my wife said, um, John, get the lighter from him, you know, get that away from him. And, and I turned around and he had gotten a fire there, but, you know, it was a little goofy and uh, uh, how he was holding it. And as I pulled it away, I said, well, David, I said, you'll only burn your finger once before you learn not to do this without asking. <laughs> and, uh, and the same thing with uh, Thanksgiving time a month ago, 
uh, that we have a retention wall in our backyard and there were leaf piles and it's a six foot retention wall. And it was the boys that were running up there thinking, all right, just falling in this thing of leaves isn't enough. I need to jump down six feet into this thing of leaves. And likewise, the, my wife and my sister were both very cautious and telling them to stop doing that. But I wanted to see what would happen, you know, if they, if they jumped out and, uh, and how that's going to act. So one of the things that you brought up that I wanted to um, play off of was, you know, um, some books that you read. So I listened to a talk by Dr. Philip Mango. It's called Understanding the Opposite Sex. Um, I haven't looked for it online. It was a CD years ago. It really helped my wife and I in our relationship do just this. And one of the things he talked about was the corpus callosum, right? 25% more connective tissue between the right and left brain, which is part of the reason why women think differently than men and why they process things differently than men. And it's been such a huge blessing in my life to really understand that and grapple with that in conversations with my wife, but as well as with my daughters, as my daughters are growing up and, and flourishing mm -hmm. into their femininity, I'll hear them just start you know, going in circles in their conversations and my natural inclination is to help them get to the end, get to the yeah. you know answer of their story. But thanks be to God in his grace, I realize that this is just part of their femininity. And there's part of me that now finds it beautiful that they um, they work through problems and they work through life like that. And I want to bring up something in conjunction with this that you and I have discussed in the past, why this is so important for men to hold true as a rule of life, you know, as something that they do to be an authentic Catholic man is because we have failed at doing this so badly for, for decades and decades. Um, and, and I think it's important for us as men to realize our failure, to accept our failure, and then to realize that, you know, in understanding women and their dignity, we have to lead by example and change the face of, of this failing that uh, men within the church and outside the church have brought upon women. So we bring up, you know, a lot of conversations of the feminist movement and things like that. And one of the biggest things that resonates with me is that women have to receive authentic love for them to expect it in a man. Yeah, and so I bring that up as a call to action for, for us as a reminder and for our listeners and for men is that if there's women in your life that aren't comfortable with you opening the door, that aren't comfortable with you, um, you know, allowing them to enter in first or, you know, to sit down first or these sort of gentlemanly practices, it's because they haven't ever received that authentic love or they haven't received it enough. And so it's it's our responsibility to constantly show them and, our, you know, obviously us as fathers to our daughters and to our wives as husbands, but to those around us, too, and to lead by example, to, ch again, change the face of understanding the authentic dignity within woman, within women in our lives, um, those closest to us, and then even our neighbors that we come in contact with. So... Um, I do think that's an excellent one. I appreciate those those thoughts um, that you presented prior. Yeah, and just one last thought there too. You know, the the culture is often very raw, right? Uh, they should say the culture is often very right about what's wrong, mm. but they're often very wrong about what the solution is. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I think they're right in the sense about toxic masculinity. Like, as women have lost a sight of their own dignity men have been only too happy to take advantage of women and to um, say, oh, well, you have no sense of femininity or, um, you know, any sense of modesty. Well, that that's fine with me. You know, I'm going to take yeah. advantage of that. And so men have gotten more bestial as women have lost sight of their own dignity. What, mm. but what feminists propose as a solution is, you know, workplace rules and government guidelines and more laws, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But all the laws in the world aren't going to change men's hearts. You That's know, what right. we really need to do as husbands and fathers is model for our sons what treating a woman should look like and model for our daughters how a man should treat them. It really starts in the home. And I think uh, a cultural revolution. Um, 
a, a counter sexual revolution in the yeah. sense of recovering feminine di- dignity is really needed right now. But it starts with acknowledging that difference and, and the culture wants to erase the difference between men and women. And that's what the at the root of so many problems right now yeah. between the relationship between men and women is the, the the progressive end of the culture is saying men and women don't exist. There's no such thing. It's just sexual preferences. It's just how you want to dress. It's just how you want to carry yourself. Mm-hmm. There is no such thing as an inherent man or woman. And that's causing all kinds of problems. Mm, like we have to start with acknowledging that women are different that's right. or we're never going to be able to treat them with the dignity that they reserve. So at any rate, uh, but yeah, let's move on to, to a good segue eight. from what we were just talking about. So I'll, I'll lead with number eight is that I will value and strive for chastity, rejecting pornography, unholy entertainment, and anything that degrades the dignity of the human person. So Sam, you took it a little bit broader here, not just not just women, but also the human person there at the end with that nice um, um, broad broad stroke. But um, but starting back at the beginning, if you want to talk about yeah, chastity, rejecting pornography, unholy entertainment, things that I know are very close to you um, and in both of us. Um, but uh, because of your work, your career, you know, has has led you into to combat these these evils in society. Yeah, I, I think it really starts with two fundamental different orientations towards the world, really. Um, I've, I've been reading some interesting neuroscience just about the way the left brain and the right brain see the world. The left brain wants to put the world to use. It mm-hmm. wants to use things. It wants to sever them from their context, it wants to um, make them utilitarian and dead and lifeless. Whereas the right brain sees the life in things, the relation, it wants to relate to things as um, not just objects, but subjects. Um, and so in the this, this, what I've been reading has been talking about the growth of the left brain in the Western world and how increasingly We're seeing the world as something to use, to use up and even exploit uh, for our own ends, but we deny the life and dignity there. And that's really translated to how we treat other people. So abortion, um, sex trafficking, pornography, so many evils in our culture and not just sex, sexual, but also like there's there's slave labor in other countries. We don't hear about it very often. We think it's a thing of the past. But I was reading even how our cell phones are often made by slave labor in Africa and things like mm-hmm. that. Terrible things that are happening in our world because we do not see the life and human dignity of the other person. Right. We think our inner world is real, but no one else's is. You're just a lifeless dead object to me to be put to use like a robot. Um, and we want to use people up. That's right. To mm. satisfy our own desires and needs, whether that's sexually, whether that's economically, in so many ways. And so chastity is not so much, it's it's also, yes, it's about sexual purity. It is. Mm. But I want to extend chastity to the broader virtue of temperance, of self-limitation. <laughs> and that's what the Western world has completely lost touch with. It's always more, 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 bigger, better. Uh, and this endless satis- creation of desires and satisfaction of desires that is without end. And that's come to, to define the Western world um, economically and again, sexually and in like really every way. It's never enough. It's just this black hole in our heart. We're trying to fill with stuff and with sexual pleasure and um, exploitation of others. And so chastity starts with the, the broad virtue of temperance. When is enough enough? Like, let's ask ourselves that hard question. Yeah. And then let's translate that to our relationship with others. So the beauty of marriage is that it's the ultimate fidelity. Um, it's a choice that we make. And I would say that every married man or woman, probably at some time, like feels an attraction to somebody outside of their marriage. That's just mm-hmm. like human nature. But we make a choice to say, no, I am going to be faithful. Um, But pornography, advertising even, but also abortion and things like that, what they say is 
keep stoking the flames of desire for something you don't have. Keep stoking those flames of dissatisfaction. And hey, guess what? We're here to sell you the thing, the promise that we can satisfy your desires. That's right. So you're sexually discontent. You're emotionally feeling disconnected from your wife. <gasps> Here's 10,000 beautiful women for you to use up and to satisfy the longings of your heart. Um, you've got a beautiful house and a nice neighborhood. It's not enough. Don't you realize you could have this beautiful couch? You could have this designer clothing. You could have this new cell phone that's only slightly different than last year's, but that's right. You know, and 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 so the flames of desire are constantly being stoked by the Western world and warring against the virtue of chastity, of self-control, of moderation, of temperance. And so we really need to yes learn sexual chastity but in a lot of ways that can only come when we learn chastity in every area of life and learn to limit ourselves and say no to our endless desires and say this is enough with 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 godliness and contentment is a great gain saint paul said so yeah. you know we have to learn to be desire holiness desire christ above all um, and then limit those other desires that really are like insatiable. They're endless. Um, yeah. It's just kind of the way human nature is, is there, but um, designed, I should say. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, obviously just to, to go straight to the heart of it, pun intended, um, you know, in scripture, blessed are the pure of heart for they shall see God or clean of heart. Yeah. But the point is, as a reminder, it is only the pure of heart that get to see God. And we are called as men to live that responsibly now, right here and now throughout our entire life and to fight against the, the temptations of the flesh, right? And um, concupiscence of the flesh. We, are fight, you know, we have to fight against those on a regular basis. And that's part of the struggle of life and part of the struggle of, of um, being a man and not being enslaved yeah. by those passions. I liked how you talked about the unholy entertainment as well, because I think we can challenge ourselves and our listeners a little bit more. I know that um, there are some listeners and there are some people that, that don't understand uh, the difficulties in everything from horror movies or, um, uh, you know, incredibly intense hard rock music and things like this that are, are really um, degrading to, to the human person and to the soul. And I feel like the unholy interest or affection or attachment to these forms of entertainment are um, in fact, you know, sinful and, and something that we need to uh, again, rid rid from our lives. Think about what you could be doing during your leisure time that would be more beneficial uh, to your life as a whole. And these are things that I've had to struggle with my own. I mean, I'm not not casting the blame. These are absolutely things that I've gone through and purged DVDs and purged music a handful of times in my life. And and I'd encourage um, our listeners to to really reflect on that and pray about that. If you're not quite sure how to approach that. Uh, give yourself a seven day prayer window where you are just praying daily uh, for God to illuminate those areas or our lady to illuminate those areas in your life. And um, again, to help um, open us up to, to authentic chastity, authentic purity, and that, um, that uh, clean heart that, uh, that allows us to see God here and now in this world. And of course, in the world um, to come in life to come. So I think it's um yeah yeah the, the, I really like that that train of thought because what we gaze upon is what we become. Mm -hmm. We commune with what we consume. Like the flames of desire can be either aimed at unholy things or at holy things. Um and often what that comes down to is what are you presenting to your senses? And what you, you gaze upon is what you long for. Think about advertisers know this. Yes. They get 30 seconds to implant a desire in your mind and they will do it. And maybe months later, you will find yourself desiring something. You think, where did that come from? <laughs> it came from an ad you may have seen months prior, but that image was enough. That, that happy person in a beautiful designer home 
with this shiny new product with a big smile on their face and planted the desire for this product will bring me happiness. Yeah. I'm going to go buy it. And so image creates desire. Music does too. But yeah. images are particularly powerful. And so I think it's so important. And I have seen people bragging on Twitter, like supposedly like traditional Catholics in some cases, mm -hmm. about watching the latest HBO shows with extreme nudity that yeah. even the world says are extreme. And they keep pushing the envelope. But it's like That's a right. frog boiling in water. We like start with something that feels innocent and then it gets worse. And I'll just I'll just ignore my, that scene. And then in the next time it's even worse. And ah, I, I just like the storyline or whatever. Before you know it, you're watching horrible graphic violence and sexuality that you would previously have thought was horrifying, but you've been yeah. desensitized to it. So just understand the power of the image to transform your desire. And likewise, and this leads kind of into our next point, but likewise, um, holy images create holy desires. Yeah. There's been times when I've just seen a stunningly beautiful statue or icon of Christ or the Blessed Virgin Mary. And there's just it just creates this longing in my heart mm -hmm. for union with God. And so holy images can create holy desires. And I think the church has always understood this and that's why it's always patronized the arts um, and created this outpouring of beauty and sacred art because it knows that the more we immerse ourselves in beauty, the more we long for the ultimate source of beauty, which is God. But the more you fill your mind and heart with corrupt images, the more you will desire corruption. Yeah. Um, so it's something we need to take very seriously. Agreed. And I would just add something very practical that's happening right now is if you guys are watching us on YouTube, you're probably seeing those Google Fi commercials because Google is trying to sell their phone plan. And it's 30 yeah, seconds, exactly what Sam is saying. And, and, and it's they don't have to pay Google because they are YouTube because they own YouTube. And so yeah. you're going to get bombarded with hundreds, literally hundreds of these 30 second little ditties and song ads. And then the moment you're annoyed with your phone, be it an iPhone, or something like that you're gonna be like man i do i want this uh, i want this google fi this this full phone plan that can and it just rings in your head you're exactly right marketers know yeah. this and so does satan right exponentially more yeah. uh, uh than marketers so yeah i think that's great i think it's excellent uh time to turn to number nine yeah i will love the blessed virgin mary in a special way and develop my devotion to her as the sure path to holiness and union with jesus christ um, this one is important to me because, uh, you know, one of the, one of the saints I really learned to love early on in my Catholic journey was St. Maximilian Colby. First mm -hmm. St. Louis de Montfort, but ultimately St. Maximilian Colby kind of became my go-to guy on this, this, uh, yes, exactly. This, um, this, but, but really what I learned from both of them was the unique role of the Blessed Virgin Mary in salvation history and, also in our own spiritual life. She is a mediatrix of all grace. And St. Maximilian Colby, I mean, as his name implies, he's the ultimate like Marian maximalist. He says some like really like bold, like almost shocking things about the Blessed Virgin Mary. He For does. example, yeah. one of the things that he says is that we need to like be become the Blessed Virgin Mary in a sense. Like we need to be like transformed into her. And I was like, when I first read that, I was like, whoa, like transformed into Mary? Like what on earth? But what he was really getting at was the Virgin Mary's will was so united with the will of God that Christ like was just incarnated in her. Like mm -hmm. it was just like an, like a, 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 a inescapable um, byproduct of her perfect union with the will of God. Yeah. And it's like, the more our will is united with the will of God, the more Christ is incarnate in us. And so what we need to be able to do is to say as perfectly as the Virgin Mary did, which is, truth be told, a lifelong journey to be able to do this, yeah. but be it done unto me according to your word with absolute freedom, with absolute sincerity. And then like the minute we do that, like Christ will be incarnate in us, like he will come and live in us in his fullness and in his, his power. And um he will be formed in us. Like when, when we become that radically like the Virgin Mary, when we take on her interior disposition so completely and totally. And so really it's like, 
the only way to do that though is to like be so close to her you know and to receive so many graces from her because she dispenses all the graces of god um that we become like her totally and completely and then christ will live in us and we will say like saint paul it is no longer i who live but christ lives in me and this sounds like a like oh man saint louis was really like off his rocker there like you know it's really no like this is a very ancient idea i remember working in an art gallery and seeing a painting from middle ages probably the 1300s i think it was it's called Mary Mediatrix of All Graces. And it showed Our Lady standing at the foot of the cross. And the blood of Christ was like pouring into her hands. And she was like distributing the blood of Christ to the world, that saving mm-hmm. blood of Christ. So Mary, among all the saints, is unique in salvation history. And more than that, all, this, all of the saints say, from like the earliest centuries of the church, that Mary is exalted above even the highest choirs of angels. Um, the angels are like in awe of her. So basically the only thing like greater than Mary is God himself. So, right. so like you want spiritual power, like you want the graces that you need, you want wisdom, you want holiness, like just get close to Mary. She'll take you to God. And the more, and, and she's not a threat to loving God. The more you yeah. love her, the more you'll love God. Like it's just a, a byproduct of that relationship. So uh, there's so much more that can be said about just kind of the mystery of who Mary is and like, but the point being, it's, it's a very manly thing to love the Blessed Virgin Mary. And as our episode on chivalry highlighted, like all the great knights of the Middle Ages, yeah. you know, they, they loved the Our Lady and that produced chivalry in them. They wanted to protect women as a result. But yeah. they, they loved Our Lady. And, and Sam and I both love Our Lady, and we could do multiple episodes on this. But I wonder, and I just asked this question here, is it because of um, Protestantism? Is it because of secularism? Is it because of, um, you know, all of these different things that we have been conditioned uh, likewise? I remember when I read St. Louis de Montfort's treatise um, on True Devotion to Mary, uh, and I struggled with a lot of this. It was about 13, 14 years ago that I was reading through it. And I'm like, Ooh, some of this is over the top. Like, um, you know, that you were saying, you know, being transformed into Mary. Um, I can gladly say, proudly say that I am a huge proponent of our lady mediatrix of all graces. I am, uh, uh wonderfully and gratefully and, and, you know, forever humbled in my consecration to her, which I just, you know, did the reconsecration December 8th, Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Um, and we just, my wife and I did the 33 days St. Louis de Montfort and, and blessed to have experienced that. And every time that I, every time, every year that we do it, um, something new, you know, comes up and, and then I start every year, I realize I just should do this 33 day devotion, like on loop, because I'm always falling deeper in love with our lady and her control over my life. And, um, but I remember, uh, yeah, St. Leonard of Port Maurice. And I was just thinking about it when you brought it up, you know, where he mentioned it is impossible that a person be saved who is not devout towards Mary. And I mean, like some of these statements, but you've got St. Bonaventure, you've got St. Alphonsus, um, two uh, doctors of the church, St. Alphonsus, his glories of Mary, you've got St. Louis de Montfort, um, which um, could be a doctor of the church, who knows, one of these days. And then, uh, yeah, Maximilian Colby talking about how we need to take it a step further. We're not slaves to Mary. We're actually instruments. We are just dull instruments that she can use at her discretion when she wants to. And, uh, and, you know, and it's, it's a really beautiful devotion. It certainly takes time for us to, um, to develop, to adapt, to, to change our faulty and errant thinking um, to, to that, which is more beautiful and which is more holy. And then uh, more relying on our, on our spiritual mother who, who loves us unconditionally and is looking to bring us to Christ, her son. Um, and so I know I started out with that question. I don't know if we want to go down that road, but it, uh, it, uh, it was, uh, you know, just a beautiful thing that every man should do. I'm going to strongly, strongly suggest to, to be a gentleman that you do the 33 day consecration, St. Louis de Montfort, um, to, to really better understand, her will and and our lives and her ability to transform us to Christ, her son, and, and, and ultimately save us. So. 
Yeah, and I, I think too that that um, experience is the best teacher. Like mm-hmm. maybe you're skeptical. Like maybe you're like, eh. Just try it out. Like just just ask her in a session. Like get to know the Blessed Virgin Mary because she's she's a real person that you can know and you can relate to. She's not an abstraction. She's not a cold statue in a church somewhere. Like she's real. She's active in the world and she can change your life, you know? And uh, so just try it out. Like just ask her intersection um, and see what she can do. And uh, I think you'll be amazed. (laughs) I love that. I'm glad you brought up the skepticism because I think that's something both of us, you from your Protestant background and me from just um, poor formation, I guess we could say, um didn't appreciate our lady um probably still don't and still working towards that but i'll say that if you're cautious about saint louis de montfort i encourage you to just type in uh I may, i'll put them in the show notes but saint louis de montfort's prayer to jesus and saint louis de montfort's prayer to mary and just read through these four or five paragraph pair prayers uh to to really get a grasp of of the entirety and the the fullness of that relationship and how they are not in competition with each other, but rather um, just in total union for um, salvation of our souls and for um, love with us. So anyways, I think that's great. Um, anything on number nine or shall we move to number 10? Yeah, like you said, we could probably do a few episodes on just that topic. We so could. maybe we will at some point, but, but let's move on to number 10. Awesome. So number 10 reads, I will value my body and care for it. So maybe I'll, I'll start with this one and then you can tell me if I'm on track since you were the one who wrote it. But, um, you know, again, it kind of goes back to what we've been talking about. I'd like to say, you know, we're a psychosomal being, right? We, we are a body mind and what we do to our body, what we do to our physical care of our body, what we experience incarnationally grabbing nice mugs, you know, beautiful rosaries or, um, you know, everything we decide to, to take action and, and put, um, on affects us mentally, emotionally, and spiritually in some way as well. And that goes down to some of the simplest things of food, drink, you know, and fitness and things like this. What we decide to consume, right, as you have already said, um, it becomes a part of us. And if we overindulge on alcohol, on sugar, on, you know, sweet drinks or these sort of things, we start becoming um, disordinately uh, impassioned or, you know, connected to these physical things. And we have a duty to maintain our, um, uh, our, our, our control of ourselves and thus uh, allowing God to, to use us and to enter into us, um, you know, to be, to be, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is we have that responsibility to pay attention to what we, put into our bodies and how we take care of our bodies, right? The person who sits and binge watches TV and sits on a couch for hours on end is not taking care of their body. They're also not taking care of their um, mind and their senses as they should be. We've all, I'm sure one time or another fallen into that. And then we start getting as St. Francis de Sales, this affection towards these, these sins, right? And, and he uses that word, he uses that affection. And then all of a sudden what happens is, is when we're not watching TV or being lazy, we kind of know that it's the right thing, but we wish that that was the right thing. And I get that disordinate affection towards these things. He brings it up in Introduction to Devout Life right at the beginning, I think chapter six, seven, eight, you know, right at the beginning there, he's talking about um, how not only do we go to confession and we need to remove ourselves or we need to confess our actual sins, but to make that firm pur- purpose of amendment, we then have to remove from our, our hearts this this disordinate affection to sin we just feel like you know i wish it wasn't a sin you know and we start justifying that and that 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 open door can be can be very wicked in our lives and so um i guess that's really when i first i guess that's the the thought process my my mind went to when i read this um this rule and and some of the necessity for for taking care of our body um in in different facets and areas of life yeah, absolutely. No, what you said about our body mind relationship is is so important. I, I mean, even in my counseling work, 
emotions are embodied. Um, one of the first things I often ask clients mm -hmm. when they're talking about like anxiety or depression or anger or any number of emotions is where do you experience that in your body? And a lot of people don't even think about that at first, but then, oh, well, I feel it in my chest or I feel it in my shoulders or um, maybe in my head or like, and what you find is 100% of the time, emotions are felt in the body. Mm -hmm. And there's been people whose physical body has been literally destroyed by emotions, whether that's resentment or guilt or anger that's never been released or trauma or something. It can affect your body severely. Um, and we see this a lot with like chronic pain and things like that. So take take that relationship seriously. So if, if you're feeling emotions that are disordered or you're feeling um, even the spiritual states at times can be affected by our bottle body, there's like this feedback where mm -hmm. a healthy spirit can often mean a healthy body, but likewise, an unhealthy body can often filter up to our spiritual life. Not always, not always. It's not a hard and fast rule, which is something to think about. Like, for example, I find myself dying so irritable lately. Like I just am exploding mm -hmm. at everybody. All right. Well, there might be something deeper going on there, but first let's start with the question. How are you sleeping at night? Yeah. Oh, well, like I didn't sleep at all last night. Like I was way up way too late drinking energy drinks and like went to bed at 2 AM, but I can't just, I can't figure out why I feel so cloudy and unable to pray. <laughs> well, maybe you should start with, like getting your sleep better. Yeah. And then maybe let's then let's check in on the irritability. Then let's check in on your ability to pray, things like that. And hey, oh, what do you know? Like I got my I'm getting eight hours of sleep. I'm going to bed at a decent hour. And all of a sudden I just feel so much more energy. I feel so much more at peace. So there's not always a relationship, not always. Because some of the great saints had horrible physical health. We know that. Right. So so it's not always a relationship, but it's a place to start because our, our mind and our, our spirit and our body are all related. And we just need to take that into account. The last thing I'll say too is we need to love our bodies without idolizing our bodies. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we need to receive our body as a gift. I think yeah. this is the helpful way to think of it is it's not just ours to do whatever we want with it, but like it is a gift from God. Yeah. So it needs to be a prudent level of self-care where we need to exercise, we need to move, we need to eat right, we need to be healthy. But it also needs to be balanced by a healthy sense of enjoyment. <laughs> like uh, I always, It always pains me to see people with really nice cars that they never drive. Like I'm a kind of a car enthusiast, um, but like you're going to have like a really nice like Corvette in your garage, but you're like so scared that you, a pebble might scratch the paint or you might hit a speed bump and, you know, um, smash the bumper or get in an accident. We never drive it. It's safer to just leave it in the garage and just polish it. You know, no, like a car was made to be driven like, and like, likewise, like God has given us all good things to enjoy, as scripture says. So like there needs to be balanced, like a self-care and health needs to be balanced by enjoyment. And we can go to, to, to either extreme where we idolize our body and we're so obsessed with health that we never do anything enjoyable. We never have a slice of cake. We never have a cigar. We never have a drink of yeah. alcohol. We never eat ice cream. We're just upset, like health becomes an end in itself. Yeah. And likewise, we can go to the other extreme where we're just smoking, you know, three packs a day. We're drinking until our liver is shot. Um, we're taking all kinds of unnecessary risks. There has to be a balance. Again, it goes back to this idea of temperance or, or, or self-control, chastity, moderation, where we acknowledge on the one hand, our responsibility to take care of our bodies. And on the other hand, we balance that with a healthy sense of enjoyment and pleasure um, that is rightly ordered um, and not immoderate. Um, but it comes down to the fact that our bodies are not useless vehicles to do whatever we want with. They're gifts from God to care for, but also to enjoy. Um, and I don't know if that 
That was great. Uh, and I, you, you reminded me of something else. It's in your book somewhere. I don't know. And I, I posted this on our Facebook page a couple of weeks ago and it got quite the, quite the flurry and quite the, the frustration. Nobody wants to be told what they should, um, what attire they should wear. But Francis de Sales also talks about this too. And again, he's speaking to those of us who are in the world. He's not speaking to, um, um, homeless. He's not speaking to um, those that are incapable of, of doing these things because of religious order, but he says something very, very keen to what you're saying, Sam, where he says, and I grabbed it here, for my own part, I should like my devout man or woman to be the best dressed person in the company, but the least fine or splendid and adorned. And that's that balance, right? Is that we are put together, we are approachable, we um, we present ourselves with the dignity uh, of God that He has given us as adopted sons and daughters, and but we are not lavish or over adorned or overdone or you know um, people are looking at us because of how much we we. Um, prepare ourselves for. And so it is that balance of moderation, even in there, that's just a beautiful thing for us to remember and to be called to. So, Yeah. yeah. Well, and that leads us to number 11, which is sometimes our bodies will fail. Sometimes we will experience suffering. Uh, and so that leads us to rule number 11. I will learn to bear sufferings with patience, carrying my cross after the Lord Jesus. Now I will say right away, that a lot of people fear this rule because they think it means self-punishment, masochism, mm. uh, looking for suffering in, in life, um, you know, uh, just putting a pebble in your shoe and just like punishing yourself, torturing yourself, whatever. No, no, no. In fact, I've read quite a few saints. I wish I had a name come to mind right now, but I've, I've read a number of saints who say, do not look for extra sufferings in life. Mm -hmm. life provides a lot of suffering on its own it's just part of living in a fallen world even people with a lot of money they have external sufferings they have internal sufferings like money does you know being wealthy doesn't solve all your problems but likewise there's there's people who aren't well off but their life it just feels like one big struggle financially health wise in almost every way but we're we're promised that life is going to be hard we can either flee from that which paradoxically increases our suffering or we can embrace it and say i'm going to accept the sufferings that god sends or that life sends or whatever you want to say um and i'm i'm going to carry my cross after christ and that can take a thousand different forms that can be persecution that can be um mockery from the world that can be emotional problems like anxiety or depression that you really struggle to escape from that can be a, a difficult marriage that can be children who rebel against you and grieve your heart it can be a hundred thousand different things but suffering will come your way that is pretty much a hard and fast rule of life so what are you going to do with that how are you going to respond to that? That is really what determines everything. There's an old saying that you can let sufferings either make you bitter or better. Uh, it's your choice. Um, you can let resentment creep in and lament the, you know, the lot you've been dealt in life. Or you can use them to grow. Uh, use them as rungs on the ladder of holiness. Um, and I think that choice really determines our fate both now and in eternity. Like uh, that is, it's that crucial. So um, sufferings will come your way. What are you going to do with that? How are you going to respond? Are you going to follow Christ to the cross? Uh, are you going to embrace the way of sacrifice and self-denial? Or are you going to seek as much pleasure and comfort as you possibly can even if it ultimately kills your soul <laughs> yeah um so. you gotta live intentionally and i mean i agree we did another full episode on suffering and and basically how to suffer like a man but a couple of those 
key things that we discussed are patience and, and silence. You know, we'd need, nobody wants you whining about your suffering all day. Of course, I'm not talking about our need to, to help, you know, seek help from people, even if that's just emotional help in a conversation with a close friend or, or spouse, if um, that's what we're being directed to, but, you know, just whining at work and whining around friends about the difficulties. And, you know, and the first thing you say, or you're waiting for that opportunity to tell them how hard things are um, is, is not manly and it's not, um, it's not holy. And that's what we're being called to, right. Be a man, be a saint. And, and so I think of a couple practical things that are always good. And I know if you've been a regular listener, it's good to be reminded I have to remind myself this on a regular basis. Um, I should remind myself this of more, but one way to combat um, kind of the, um, uh, our sufferings and so to handle sufferings with patience and with peace is to be grateful in all things in life, right? The more gratitude we overflow in the things that we have been given or even in our suffering, you know, you think of St. Alphonsus and his uniformity with God's will. He actually talks about how it's, it's so much more efficacious or fruitful or more, uh, you know, pleasing to God to hear us give thanks in time of suffering, then, you know, I think it's like a thousand thanks in times of not, but, you know, there's some sort of poetic uh, language that he uses. But the point is, is that if we're grateful when we aren't experiencing direct or intense or, you know, prolonged suffering, we're going to be able to handle the suffering with, with patience and with, with a certain sense of, um, of gratefulness as well. It might not be gratefulness for that exact suffering. I brought up a a talk that let's just, if we can't suffer joyfully, let's start by suffering peacefully. And in order to do that, we have to, we have to be grateful in, in all things in life. So I just encourage our listeners, I encourage anybody who's listening, who knows me and uh, hears me whining to, <laughs> to call me to, uh, a, you know, a more authentic um, uh, masculinity and, and a more uh, holy way of living. And that is um, suffering and patience and you know, and maintaining gratefulness, you know, throughout it all. Yeah. And I, I think too, the other thing we forget so easily is that the Christian life is really about transformation. It's about mm -hmm. rebirth. Um, a lot of Protestant like pop versions of Christianity are, you know, Joel Osteen and that sort of thing. It's all about your best life now. Like, no, like it's about becoming like Christ and that means involves a rebirth like we're reborn in baptism right well if anyone like i've been present in all my wife's labors and deliveries of my children and every time let me tell you it's a painful process <laughs> it's a painful process for the baby and for the mother mm -hmm. um but it, it's a process of 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 moving from one state to another from being in the womb where it's kind of cozy and comfortable coming out into this like bigger world, you know, and mm. that's a painful thing. And it's the same for us as we grow into our true spiritual dignity as sons of God's sons of God. It's, it's, it's a transformation. It's a putting to death of the old man and a putting on the new man that's made in the image of Christ. And that's a process of transformation that is painful. It's, you know, there's a beautiful scene in, um, chronicles of narnia I can't remember which book i think it's mm -hmm. prince caspian maybe sure. well anyway one of the, the the kind of nasty little uh cousin uh what was his name diggory yeah uh yeah he transformed into a dragon mm -hmm. and he has to essentially learn repentance through the, the series of the story but once he does aslan says all right well now you can stop being a dragon but the only way for him to do that is to peel off the dragon skin that's on the outside. And then he's like a transformed boy at the end. But boy, let me tell you, peeling off that dragon skin, it hurts. He's like crying the whole process, like wants to stop, but he like really wants to be a boy again. Um, but that's kind of like what the Christian life is like sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's like, we have to, we have to like shed the old man, so to speak. And that's a painful process that involves suffering. But at the end, like we will be like Christ. And, and um, so just accept the sufferings that God sends your way. He knows what you need. He knows what you can handle. He's not going to overwhelm you, even though it might feel like it at a time. Uh, he's not going to give you any more than you can handle. 
but um, the goal is transformation in the likeness of Christ. Amen. No, I think that's wonderful. So the next rule, number 12, which is another pair of virtues that we have to work on is I will carry myself with humility and integrity, taking responsibility for my actions. And, uh, you know, doesn't that call back to uh, really even the philosophers of old, right? That the that the fact of taking responsibility for your actions and and all areas of life, good and bad, you know, when you're ashamed of yourself um, or when you are uh, you've done something well, right? We take responsibility for it all and we don't hide behind it or look to point blame, you know, or even look to point blame on our our health or mental conditions, right? Uh, we try and take responsibility for our actions. And when I've said health and mental conditions, I was thinking, you know, specifically of I've, I've known people that um, do awful things, but then they'll say, well, you know, I was... I was drinking too much or something like that. I mean, that's a sin in itself. And, um, and so again, they're avoiding responsibility and looking to point the blame. And that is very boyish, right? That's very immature. And that's not what it means to be a man or a gentleman. And um, this is hard for us as men, right? Because of the male ego, right? That's something that we uh, will, it's good to, to acknowledge and to accept the fact that we like to be, you know, the leader of the pack. We like to be in control of our world or of our relationships or of our, um, even of our um, growth and holiness, right? We look to be control over these things, but it's the truly the humble man that uh, takes a step back and understands that it's only going to be by God's grace that he's going to get through things. And I know I mentioned being ashamed earlier, and I think that's actually something that um, that we could reflect further on is is the fact that um, you know, in those moments of, of being ashamed, we understand our own weakness and our own inability to, to control things. And then that just opens us up more for God's grace and for his transformative power uh, to, to affect our lives and to push us into a better state of, of being around our relationship with others, ourselves, and with, of course, um, God in heaven. So... Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think the 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 blame shifting uh, goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, mm. right? So, like Adam, uh, the woman you gave me, she made me eat the fruit. <laughs> like the, the very first uh, denial of responsibility. Like maybe the world would be a very different place right now if Adam had said, "You know, you're right. Like I shouldn't have done. I shouldn't have done that. I take full responsibility, and That's I right. will make this right." Like. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not what happened, right? It's like, it was blame Eve, right? Uh, well, men still are doing that today. And yeah, I think it's mm -hmm. comes down to um, a fear of vulnerability. Like taking responsibility means making yourself vulnerable for the consequences. Mm -hmm. And am I hurt? Like you might feel some pain if you do that. But like men, men don't like that. But but there's, you know, even psychologically, like they talk about um, in the in the like field of counseling and everything, therapy and like, psychotherapy they talk about the, an internal locus of control or an mm -hmm. external locus of control so an internal locus of control is like i am responsible for my actions what happens in in my life is to a great degree my responsibility like i take responsibility for the things that i do and i am not a victim mm -hmm. the external locus of control is things happen to me and i'm completely helpless mm -hmm. i am a victim like like you were saying about like mental health or anxiety or like, well, I was, I'm bipolar. That, that gives me the right to like abuse you. Well, like, no, that's no, yeah. you have to take responsibility for that. And if you need help, get help. Yeah. But um, I think uh, I've seen a lot of men who maybe are still living in their parents' basement or something like that. Yeah. They're like, well, I can't help it. Like I just didn't get the education that I need or it's my parents' fault or like, I just, um, I, I applied for a job and like, the the manager didn't like me oh poor me you know or like i tried to do this and the fate fate is against me like um you know covid hit and i quit doing it and, you know or you know i just uh i i don't know i i my leg hurts and like i don't want to get out of bed and like like no like y y we all have obstacles internal and external in life some greater than others absolutely but again it goes back to what are you going to do with that and 
I heard someone once say that life is what you do with what you're dealt. Mm. Life is going to deal you a deck of cards. Like That's right. you may, or you may not like it. You may not like the hand that you've been dealt, but what are you going to do with it? And I think the saints show that in an incredible way that some of them came from the most disadvantaged backgrounds possible. Some of them came from extremely privileged backgrounds. It didn't really matter. Yeah. What mattered was pursuing Christ with their whole heart. And that's what changed everything for them and made them saints that they were. Was It wasn't about how poor they were. There were saints who came from absolute destitution. Yeah. And, you know, rose to the height of sanctity, you know, and, and served in incredible ways and became advisors to kings. And like, like, it didn't matter where they came from. And there was other saints who came from wealthy families, like St. Francis of Assisi, who like gave it all up to follow Christ. So again, it's, what are you going to do with the things that, that God sends you in the course of your life? It, life is a task of learning to love. And if we can use the, the uh, challenges that come our way, again, as uh, rungs on the ladder of holiness, like we use them to climb higher rather than allowing them to beat us down, um, that'll change everything for us. Um, but it starts with that choice to take responsibility, to say, you know, I'm not responsible for what happens to me, but I am responsible for how I respond to it. Um, and that inner orientation of choosing your response to the things you can't control, hmm. that, that changes everything. Agreed. And so that we don't miss the point on humility, and we've had another whole episode on this as well, but, you know, as St. Augustine said, the three virtues that are going to get you into heaven are humility, humility, and humility. And so it is uh, incredibly important. I'd like to encourage our listeners, uh, if you're if you are prone to pride and you're really struggling with pride, I'd encourage you to uh, pray the litany of humility, but really meditate on it as you pray it. You know, pick 14 days, 30 days, pray through that litany of humility and pause on each section and reflect on your own life. Also encourage you to do nightly examines um, and, and go to confession more frequently, right? So the man who goes to confession and takes that honest um, look on his life, I, I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I know there was this quote that I came across recently um, that uh, servant of God, Dorothy Day, I think she's a servant of God, um, uh, stated was that, you know, I see the sins in others and I see it, you know, so clearly because it is of my own sins that, that I see it like this, you know, and I just, I feel like when, when you're, when you're focused daily introspective on, on yourself and on the difficulties of, uh, your ability to do the right thing, you're going to grow in humility. It's going to help you grow and, you know, break down that pride, get down to the quick of, of the pride that's rooted within us so that we can become more humble men. Yeah. Yeah. Last yeah and that kind of leads least. us to our last point. Yeah. I will always tell the truth. The last, last commandment here, uh, last point in the rule of life, yeah. but, but really why is it so important? Like, because humility what we just ended with on the previous one humility is truth it's being what you are and not escaping from that with all your weaknesses with all your flaws with all your failures and the more we get to know ourselves the more there is a desire to again like adam in the garden like hide from that reality hmm. oh like we one day it dawns on us like who i am is really kind of unlovely like there's a lot of sin in my heart there's a lot of disordered passions there's a lot of greed and envy and lust and anger and bitterness and unforgiveness and oh my goodness like i'm just i can't let anyone see this like i can't let anyone know who i really am so i'm gonna you know put on the pious catholic face i'm gonna like carry my rosary in my fist and like you know holy cards and do all the novenas and like but whatever the case might be i can never let anyone know who I really am. That's just mm. too embarrassing. Too but like true humility mm. is being honest. It's being truthful. It's being before the world, what you are before God and being before God, what you are 
before the world. Um, it's that refusing to hide. It's saying, I'm not going to lie because lying nine times out of 10 is just protecting ourselves. Mm-hmm. I'm going to speak the truth. Come at me. And that can be scary. That can be hard. That can be painful sometimes. Um, but God is truth. And if we want to live holy, we want to be like God, God like holy, you know, then we must be honest. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to go around telling everybody your sins. Like this mm-hmm. is not talking about like a general confession to the whole world, but it is that humility again. Like it's mm-hmm. saying, I am what I am, and what I am is quite weak and pathetic. I'm not gonna hide that. Yeah. But my strength is in Christ alone and that is where my hope is found um that's what saint paul said like saint paul planted dozens of churches was one of the most incredible missionaries in church history and basically at the end of the day he said what i am is weakness Mm. like that's it Uh, i don't have anything to hide and what a difference from when he was a pharisee hiding from the world presenting this picture of strength and power and accomplishment religiously um so be honest about who you are but also speak the truth um live in you know what is what is truth uh well according to aquinas it's conformity with reality yeah like um what you say aligns with reality what you do aligns with reality and ultimately who you are aligns with reality like there's no hiding anymore um so let's let's live according to reality let's live let's not delude ourselves and let's not seek to deceive others um let's live according to the truth yeah and i like the positive there that i will always tell the truth and your the last rule wasn't i will never lie right it wasn't uh, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And it was, uh, which is a commandment. Yes, but it really is proactive. And I like that nature of it because we as men are called to that. We are called to be proactive. We are called to spread the gospel to the corners of the earth. We are called by our example, by our words, by our relationships and engagement with others to live the truth as it has been explained and as it has been taught to us. And we are called to that. And we are speaking kind of on a higher level. We're not breaking this down to, you know, if my wife asked me how she looks in this clothes, you know, or something like that, we should, you know, should always be charitable. We should always tell the truth, but, but really in our life, right. um, Very few of us are ever going to have to be in this moral conundrum place where, you know, um, by telling the truth means we would be opening somebody up to grave sin or something like that. So we're not talking about these. That'll be another episode for another <laughs> time. But, but I really like that positive of always telling the truth and the importance of, of always living in the truth as you are getting at, right? It's, it's more than just telling the truth. It really is living in the truth by how we live, act, and exist in this world, how other people see us. And when no one's watching you know, how we're, how we are acting, um, you know, our character and our integrity. So um, anyways, I um, think that's a great place uh, to end. And Sam, I'll start by thanking you for the book and thanking you for the 13 uh, rules. Hopefully you guys enjoyed these. I am going to put this book in the, if you made it this far, I'm going to put the book in the show notes and, um, and we offer it um, on the Catholic gentleman store and uh, yours truly, Sam Guzman, on this show here um, is the one who wrote it. So anyway, Sam, I'm grateful for your time. Grateful that we could get together and, and talk through this. Yeah, well, God bless you. I, I uh, really enjoyed the discussion and going through these, these rules in, in more depth. So. Amen. So as we end every episode, especially this one leading up to Christmas, Be a man, be a saint.